Okay. Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming. This is PG2 and U getting distributed with Elixir. Um, my name is Eric Enton. Uh, you might know me on Twitter, GitHub, or IRC as Antipax. Um, and I work for a company called FanDuel. And uh, we have a couple Elixir projects in production, um, all of which are distributed. Um, so just to get started, I just kind of wanted to get like a show of hands. Who here has never written any Elixir before? Okay, cool. Who's like, you know, been playing around with it a bunch and, you know, in the free time? Okay, cool. Who's doing it at work at all? Okay, cool. And who has something in production? And this is like unbelievable, honestly. Like, last year's Elixir Conf, maybe like 5% of the people in the room had something in production. So I think there's been a real shift here. Um, from it being something that people are just interested in to something that people are like getting actual real work done in, and I just think that's awesome. Um, and so, you know, one thing that I think um, people have a little bit of trouble with when they learn Elixir is actually making the jump from um, Elixir on a single node to Elixir, you know, on multiple nodes. Um, and I think we can all agree that distributed applications are awesome, right? You get fault tolerance, you get better performance, you know, all the advantages that we're all familiar with from distributed applications, right? Um, and if you've used it, I think we all can agree that distributed Elixir is really awesome. I mean, just look at how much fun these guys are having. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think that we all kind of know um, that what makes distributed Elixir really awesome is, is distributed Erlang and OTP. And, <laughs> and, you know, if anybody hasn't seen this before, this is from a, a YouTube video called Erlang the Movie. Um, and I, I highly suggest you watch it. It's really entertaining. Um, and it's kind of like mind-blowing, right? Because you watch this video and you see them, like, interacting with, um, you know, uh, the Erlang shell in, like, the 80s. And they're still typing the exact same things that we're typing today, right? It really hasn't changed that much. Um, so even though distributed Erlang and OTP and distributed Elixir are, are really awesome, right? Um, distributed applications are hard. <laughs> They're really hard, right? Um, for a number of reasons, um, you know, just the nature of physics, right? Um, the speed of light makes distributed applications hard. The complexity of distributed applications um, makes them hard, all that stuff, right? And um, even though we all love Elixir and Erlang. Uh, Erlang OTP is not magic. Um, <laughs> right, and, and thank you to whoever created that thing on Google Image Search. I don't know if anybody here has ever done a presentation before and they just type something into Google Image Search hoping that maybe someone has created an image that fits a term. And when I typed Erlang is magic, this is what came up and I... <laughs> I, that's unbelievable. <laughs> but um, it does provide some really nice tools that make distributed applications like a little bit easier to build, right? Um, and one of these tools, shockingly, is called PG2. And PG2 provides distributed named process groups, okay? Um, so what is that? Um, PG2 allows us to create, join, and query groups of processes across a cluster, right? So in detail, you know, we can access a group of processes by a common name, right? So this is similar to like process registration. You give a process a name, you can find it later on the local node, right? Except in this case, there's a set of processes that are given a name, and it can be across multiple nodes, right? And we can send a message to one, some, or all of these group members. And if a member process terminates, it's automatically removed from the group. Now that's like really useful and important. Right, so um, that's kind of the high-level idea of what it does, right? And I'm sure some people here, are like, I don't really, still don't really get it. So I always find it's really useful to take a look at, you know, an example of how how the tool is actually used, right? Um, so we're going to take a look at a real-world example of PG2 in use in a chat app, <laughs> right? The classic Elixir example, right? Um, using Phoenix channels, right? Which I'm sure you're all familiar with Phoenix channels probably at this point. Um, 
But for anybody that isn't, it's an a, a API that Phoenix provides uh, that gives you bi-directional communication for soft real-time functionality. Right? So let's take a look at kind of a diagram of, of how our Phoenix chat app works on a single node. Okay? We have a Phoenix server. We have a couple devices. And let's say one of these devices wants to send a message to the chat room. Right? So it's going to send a message. And then our Phoenix server simply sends a message to the other devices. Right? That's you know classic broadcast. Um, and that's how, on a single node, a chat app can work. Right? We receive a message. We broadcast it to um, the rest of our listeners. And you know that's easy. Right? Um, that's not complicated at all. Um, you know, I'm sure people have built that themselves before, um, you know, before Phoenix existed, right? But, uh, you know, what about when we outgrow one server, right? Um, and I, I put a little note here that it's probably for redundancy because you're probably not going to hit Phoenix's performance characteristics limits on a single node, right? Um, so let's take a look at our distributed Phoenix chat app now, right? So we still have a Phoenix server. But now we have a second Phoenix server, right? And this little line in the middle just sort of is a representation of the fact that um, anything that is on, you know, except for the servers, any items in this diagram that are on separate sides of this line are not, are connected to the given server that they're on the side of the diagram with, right? So we have a tablet and a phone connected to the first Phoenix server and a browser connected to the second Phoenix server. So let's see what happens again when, when our first client uh, wants to send a message, right? We send the message to the first server, right? But what do we do now? Because we have this browser client that's connected to a separate Phoenix server, um, and this phone client, which is still connected to the same server, right? So we can't use that exact same strategy we used before. What we can do is we can send the message from our server to our other servers um, and to any clients that are connected locally. And then our other server can send that message on to uh, any clients that it has connected to it that are interested in that message. Um, so the question, I mean, so this, this is a familiar pattern, right? This is like fan out. I'm sure people have seen this before. And, and this kind of can um, scale out to, you know, as many servers as we have, essentially. You know, instead of it being one arrow between this first server and the second one, we'd have this arrow between multiple servers, right? But the question is, 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 is how is this actually implemented in Phoenix, right? Um, how, do, how do we do that, uh, you know? Um, and if we take a look at a really sort of simplified um, version of how Phoenix PubSub works, right? We have a PubSub server, which manages some channels, which multiple sockets can be interested in each uh, channel. And then we have clients, which are attached to those sockets, right? And, you know, again, this is an incredibly simplified version of um, how this works, right? But the really important part here is that this PubSub server is a process that's running on each node, right? That's the important thing to note here. Okay, so going back to our um, distributed uh, chat app, you know, that we have a question, right? If, if we have a pub sub server on each of these nodes, and we want to send this message from this first server to the second server, um, how do we find the pub sub server on our nodes? Right? Like we can't just register it because that's a local thing, right? I mean, technically we can kind of get around that. Um, but it's not the best way to do it. And you know, um, so what we can use is PG2. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and uh, Justin Schneck just asked me to put this GIF in a slide when I posted it on Twitter. So um, it's, this was the only place it fit. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, yeah, by having our Phoenix pub sub servers join a PG2 group, right, we can fan our messages out across the cluster. And you know, I just wanted to put a little disclaimer here that you know, in practice, pub sub is implemented you know via adapters. So we can use PG2, Redis. Um, as Chris was talking about earlier, you know, maybe one day we can actually use uh, Phoenix Presence for process groups. Um, so maybe in the future, Phoenix won't even need PG2. So this talk is already irrelevant. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> but um, let's take a really quick look at like a really simplified code example of, of how this actually works within Phoenix, right? So here we have um, our super simplified Phoenix PubSub server that uses PG2, right? Um, and it's a gen server. 
And when the server starts, it's going to create a group. So one thing you may notice here that's an advantage of PG2 over um, you know, normal process registration is that your group's name doesn't have to be just an atom, right? It can be any Elixir term. So in this case, our group's name is uh, a tuple containing the atom Phoenix, or P PHX, and a server name. And the server name is kind of just a way for if you have multiple Phoenix apps within one node to separate out their, um, you know, their PubSub servers. Um, so this server name is pretty much going to be you know, your OTP app's name, just so you have an idea of what that's for. Um, and after we create this group, we're going to join this group. And another thing that you may notice um, is that when we join a group, it doesn't have to be um, ourselves. It could be any process uh, that we have the PID of, right? So after we've joined this group, uh, what do we do with this, right? And if we take a look a little bit further down in the code, um, we'll see something similar to this. It'll be a, pro a broadcast um, function, right, which takes a server name, um, a topic, and a message. And all we're going to do is, is use PG2 to get the members of our group, which are going to be PIDs. And then for each of those PIDs, we're going to send it a message saying that we're broadcasting this topic and this message, right? And then in our you know, usual handle info callback, we're going to receive that message. And then we're just going to call this sort of pretend local.broadcast function, which is actually going to go and see, are there any clients actually connected to the server you know, that, that we're currently running on that we can actually broadcast this message to that are interested in this message, right? So um, in practice, Phoenix PubSub is, is more complicated thanks to like extensive optimization, right? Like we won't, you won't actually see um, a message being sent to every member of the group. Um, basically, uh, if, if we're sending a message, uh, then locally we'll just automatically try to broadcast locally. We won't send a message to ourselves for no reason, we're just going to do that. We're, so we're only going to send the message to other nodes. But you know, there's a couple other optimizations in there, but this is essentially how it works, right? Um, so I mean, I think the interesting thing here is that that's kind of the sum total of PG2, right? Like that's all the functionality in PG2. You can create groups, you can join them, you can get their members. That's basically it, right? But I think one really interesting thing um, that we can do with PG2 is we can look at how it works, right? Um, because um, basically, it's actually using all these um, uh, pieces of the OTP toolbox to implement its functionality, right? And, and by reading the code of PG2, right, and understanding how it works, too, we can learn about kind of how it behaves under load. So, um, in order to answer these questions and, and learn exactly how PG2 works, I actually translated the code to Elixir, right? So um, introducing re-PG2, because <laughs> I didn't want to call it PG3. <laughs> 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 um, and it's, it's a highly documented translation of the original Erlang PG2 implementation to Elixir, you know, purely for educational purposes. So I'm sure some people are saying, you know, like, why exactly would you do this? Like you could just read the code, right? The PG2 code. Um, and I mean, that's true, right? The, the true specification of behavior, you know, is the code itself, right? So by reading the code of our favorite software, we can gain a deeper understanding. But, you know, not everyone knows Erlang, right? And despite the high quality of the implementation, PG2's Erlang code, it's not necessarily easy to read even if you know Erlang. Um, you know, the, the OTP code is pretty old. Um, and so sometimes there's a lot of kind of like warts in there. Um, so anyway, sometimes you just do it for fun because you're bored, <laughs> right? So um, in the, the view of you know, trying to accomplish these goals, um, I kind of set out some like guiding principles for the translation, right? Because um, you could translate code from Erlang to Elixir in a lot of different ways, make a lot of different trade-offs, right? So first of all, um, read PG2 code should be idiomatic, easy to read, and fully, you know, perhaps even over-documented Elixir, right? Um, and read PG2 should be identical to PG2 in terms of its functionality and performance characteristics, even if it has been refactored to increase clarity. And code which exists purely for backwards compatibility may be eliminated in the interest of clarity, right? 
So the idea here is that essentially I'm trying to preserve everything that's kind of important in terms of how the original Erlang PG2 uh, implementation works uh, while kind of removing the stuff that maybe makes it harder to understand at a glance. Um, additionally, a tests were also written for XUnit um, for full re-PG2 code coverage, which includes a distributed suite that interacts with um, multiple nodes. So, you know, what are some uh, differences between re-PG2 and PG2, right, given these principles? Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, re-PG2 does not have the same backwards compatibility as PG2, and it's only been tested on uh, uh, OTP 18.3 and Elixir 1.2.4. So you can see when I wrote this, <laughs> it was a while ago. <laughs> um, also, you guys might not know this, but um, so PG2 is started under something called the kernel safe SUP or supervisor, which is a special OTP kernel supervisor for important services that it considers safe to restart. So you as a user don't get to put processes into this supervisor. Um, and these are other services like, um, so PG2 is one of them. Um, I'm actually drawing a blank right now <laughs> on other ones that are in there, but all the really kind of important stuff that you wouldn't want to possibly have affected by uh, user code are gonna be in this special supervisor. And re-PG2 is just a normal OTP application. And also, PG2 will actually start itself if it hasn't been started yet when you use it. Um, RePG2 actually expects to be um, added to the applications in your mix.exs, and it, it won't start itself. So, you know, how much work was this translation, right? Uh, it actually really wasn't much work at all because PG2 is like really tiny. Um, and in fact, PG2 is only 333 lines of code, right? So that's, that's kind of mind blowing, right? That like, <laughs> that you get what seems like a really complicated piece of functionality um, with such a small amount of code, right? And, and again, you know, the, it's this simple because of other useful tools that OTP provides, right? And RePG2 uses all these tools as well, okay? So if we take a look at PG2's OTP toolbox, we have a couple things that we're probably familiar with and maybe some things that we're not, right? We have Gen Server, that's probably familiar to everyone here. We have ETS, that's also probably pretty familiar to everyone here. We have the Global Module. I think some people probably haven't heard of this one before. Um, and then we have Node and Process Monitoring, and I'm sure people are aware of Process Monitoring, but maybe they haven't seen Node Monitoring before. So let's take a look at each of these individually, um, and all of these apply equally to RePG2, right, because they, it uses these tools in the same way. And you know, additionally, by looking at how PG2 uses these tools, I'll actually be able to gain you know, like as much of a high-level understanding of kind of how it works as I can give you guys um, today. So first of all, looking at you know, how it uses GenServer, um, each node which is using PG2 has a, has a PG2 server process running, right? And this server process serves as the central point of interaction for PG2 between you know, and within each node. Okay, and that, that, that's a pretty common uh, pattern, right? Um, in terms of ETS, if you haven't heard of it before, ETS is an in-memory concurrent storage solution for Elixir terms. And in PG2, ETS is used to store uh, process groups and their memberships. So one advantage of this is that reads can happen from any process, but in order to avoid race conditions, writes are serialized through the node's PG2 server. So, you know, ETS is a really useful tool. It's in the uh, Getting Started Guide on, you know, the Elixir Lang homepage, right? So, obviously, it's pretty important. Um, and this pattern in particular is very common. And, in fact, that Getting Started Guide on the Elixir Lang uh, site actually, you know, goes through this kind of pattern where you can read from any process, but you serialize your writes through a single server in order to prevent race conditions. So, the global module provides a few different things. Um, one thing it provides is uh, cluster global name registration for processes that you probably shouldn't use because it has a number of performance issues. Um, but it provides a couple other things, including uh, cluster locks, okay? And one function that global provides is called 
uh, trans, you know, which is for transaction. And this function actually acquires a lock across the entire cluster. Um, and it uses any Elixir term as a key, runs a provided function, and after the function completes, a lo the lock is released, right? So one interesting thing you can do is that by combining, um, and one thing the PG2 does, is that by combining this, this trans function with GenServer's multi-call, which actually allows us to call all the processes registered with a given name within a cluster, um, PG2 can actually ensure that only one process across the entire cluster can modify any given group at a time, right? So what this means is, is that across the entire cluster, anytime we join or create or leave a group, we're actually acquiring a lock across the entire cluster that is ensuring that when we send our message to the PG2 server on each uh, node, that we're the only uh, process that's being allowed to do that at any given time, right? And this pattern can actually be very useful in our own code. We have to be careful because, you know, we're introducing a lock, we're introducing network round trips, all that kind of stuff. But, trans you know, a global transaction plus a multi-call can be very useful in terms of synchronizing uh, activity across an entire cluster, right? Um, and then we have node and process monitoring, okay? So, one interesting thing that a lot of people are probably not familiar with um, is a function on the module net kernel called monitor nodes. And this actually allows the calling process to register for notifications about nodes connecting and disconnecting from the cluster. So that's like really useful. Um, you can use that when a new node joins to uh, start processes on it or you know, do whatever you have to do. Um, and in PG2's case, when the PG2 server receives a notification that a new node is connected, it actually merges the groups and memberships between itself and the new member's PG2 server. And additionally, um, PG2 registers a monitor for each process, which joins the group, right? And if the monitor reports that the process is down, which could be either because the process died or because its node disconnected, the process's membership is actually removed from the local view of the data. That's pretty much all, that's how PG2 works, right? That's, that's kind of at the high level, like, that's it really, right? So kind of what are some like key insights that we can take away from, from those PG2 implementation details, right? So first of all, PG2 uses global locks, right? And that's not ideal. <laughs> um, so while reading group memberships is very fast, right? Um, Modifying them is actually a globally locked operation requiring multiple network round trips, all right? And what that means is, is that we may run into problems with lock overhead if our groups contain a large number of memberships, right? So PG2 may not be the solution for you if you have thousands of processes that you're trying to put into a group across a cluster that you all want to send a message to, right? That probably not the right solution. However, if you have only maybe one process per node, that's going into a group, this might be fine. And especially if they don't restart very frequently, this may be totally okay. So another insight is that PG2 is actually a distributed database, right? Um, we have some data, it's distributed across multiple nodes. We can query it, we can write to it. It's a distributed database. And so when we talk about distributed databases, we talk about the CAP theorem, right? And in terms of CAP, PG2 is, is AP. It's available and partition tolerant, right? And the reason why it's AP is because cluster partitions will actually only see groups and memberships from nodes that are reachable, right? Um, however, um, PG2 is eventually consistent in that it will automatically heal from any partitions. You know, again, like as I mentioned before, when a new node joins, we're actually gonna merge all of the data from those two nodes together, okay? And, you know, this is kind of like, one of the reasons why PG2 can be so simple is because process groups are actually like uniquely easy to distribute uh, due to monitors and the fact that conflicts can be easily resolved by emerging, right? Like normally in a distributed database, you have to determine what to do when there's two conflicting rights. You have to determine what to do when, you know, a new node joins or a node leaves, right? Because process groups, basically the semantics are like, if I can't reach this process, I don't want it in my group locally anyway. Um, when we see that a process has gone down due to the monitor, we just remove it from our local view of the data, and that's fine. And because when we want to you know, uh, resolve the conflicts, 
we can just merge all the data together because these PIDs are, um, you know, unique. Um, it, it's just it's very easy to handle these kinds of problems that normally show up in a distributed database. And so, you know, I'll leave you with that. You know, overall, PG2 is like an amazingly powerful tool. Um, but you should just be aware of the caveats, right, before you use it. And that's kind of maybe one of the reasons why um, what Chris was talking about today is so cool is because, you know, when we kind of move to this totally decentralized, um, you know, lock-free implementation of process groups, um, you know, we can have those, like, process groups with, you know, maybe thousands of processes in them, and that's not a problem. So I'll leave you with, you know, you should check out repg2 for more examples. Um, you know, I wanted to kind of put a whole bunch of code on the screen today, but that never really turns out so great. Um, so check out repg2 for more examples, including how to build a distributed test suite, which I think is something that people are probably interested in seeing how to do. And repg2 actually has um, a little bit of extra code that actually handles starting and stopping uh, the other nodes in the test for you, so you don't have to manually start nodes when you do your test, which is kind of nice. Um, and that's my talk, so thank you all for coming, and if you have any questions. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to answer questions about this talk, or my work at FanDuel, or um, Mix XREF, or Mix Test Stale, or any of the other stuff that I've worked on. Hi. How do you connect Erlang nodes to each other um, mm -hmm. if you have an auto-scaling deployment? Because you need to be able to connect nodes together to create a PG2 group, right? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, we actually do this um, on EC2 at FanDuel. Um, and basically, the way that we implement it is, is that each node that should uh, be connected to each other is actually given an EC2 tag. Um, and then essentially when a node starts, one of the uh, workers that's added to its um, supervision tree, essentially just every 30 seconds it goes and queries the EC2 API for all of the nodes that are in that tag. And then it just tries to connect to all of them that it isn't already connected to. So it's pretty simple. Yep. Mm -hmm. I guess expanding on that, how does it signal to the, the cluster that like it is actually gone and not just disconnected from oh, okay, the Okay, sure, cluster? yeah. So um, that's actually, um, it's part of the, your OTP configuration, your Erlang configuration, is actually a tick rate. So I think the default tick rate is 15 seconds. And the way that that works is, is that every 15 seconds, every node that's connected in your cluster is going to essentially ping every other node. Um, and also what's configurable is the number of these ticks that can pass by without a response from another node to indicate that that node is, is no longer connected to the cluster. So once that number of ticks passes, the node is considered gone. And it can come back by, you know, in, in the case that we were talking about before, it comes back by maybe, you know, once the network issue or whatever resolves um, that every 30 seconds when it checks the tags to find all the other machines, it'll eventually come around and find a node that it can connect to and it'll reconnect. Yeah. Um, when you're designing, starting to design an application and you know that at some point you're probably gonna wanna use PG2, Mm -hmm. Should you, is it better to sort of just design that way, you know, use it from the start, or do you just, do you find it's easier to sort of assume you're only running everything locally and then sort of add PG2 on later? Yeah, good question. Um, I think one of the really cool things about Elixir and Erlang in general is the location independence. Um, you know, you don't need to really know what node a process is running on if you have its PID, right? Um, because the PID contains information about the node. So what I would say is, is that as long as you provide some kind of interface that's kind of like, you know, do thing for name blah with data blah, right? Even if initially that only, you know, 
runs the code in the current process or sends a message to a local process, a single local process, in the future you can enhance that to be, you know, to get members of a PG2 group and, and do something more complicated. Um, and in general, you know, um, adding PG2 to an application is pretty easy. It's really just adding that group create and that group join to your init function for the processes that you want to be in a group. Um, so, you know, I don't think you need to necessarily design it with PG2 in mind initially, um, but when you find that you need the tool, it's, it's usually pretty easy to, to add, yeah. Just a quick follow-up to um, uh -huh. using PG2 for like a singleton sort of process, like a process group just that can, always contains exactly one process. Is that a you know a pattern that's used commonly or? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, there's tools that are better at doing that. Like generally, if you want a process that you know a single process in a group, then that's technically a process registry and not a process group. So. You have um, the global modules registration stuff as an option if you want to do that. You have, um, if you only want to do things uh, locally, you have, you know, GProc as an option. Maybe you've seen that before. Um, you know, if you only want to do it locally and you want your names to not just be an atom, you can use GProc. Um, and then there's a number of options in terms of an actual distributed process registry. And they all kind of make different... Uh, trade-offs in terms of what their failure characteristics are and their performance and that kind of stuff. But yeah, I have seen that before. I have seen just a single process in a PG2 group, um, and it works fine. You know, you just have to make sure that really only one process is getting into that group, which can be, uh, you know, complicated depending on, you know, how things are set up. I think we have time for two more questions. Hi, uh, can you maybe give us some examples about how you guys at FanDuel use PG2 or yeah, distribute sure. your applications? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so the product that we use PG2, uh, so we use PG2 actually in multiple um, projects. Um, one project um, essentially involves having a number, it's kind of, so basically it's a, it's a work queue Right, but instead of, um, let's say, like a queue advertising some work and workers grab it, um, the queue itself actually connects to nodes and runs work on those nodes as, you know, using, um, you know, Erlang's various facilities for doing that kind of thing. Um, so it's kind of an inverse of how a work queue usually works. And those workers actually join a PG2 group in order for them to be found across the cluster. Um, and then additionally, we use PG2 in another product, which is um, a, uh, it's a game. So we have a number of uh, back-end servers, which will actually have a process, which is kind of like the gatekeeper process for that node, join a PG2 group. And that process is responsible for returning answers to requests for information about stuff like how loaded is this node with games at the moment? Is this a good node to put a new game onto? And that kind of stuff. So it can be really useful in terms of like, you know, being able to query multiple nodes for information about some things that they're doing, or, you know, that sort of stuff. So that's kind of the two ways that we use PG2. Anyone else? Cool. Thank you, guys.